Hi, my name is David Day of Today Photographic Art. I'm an ICM photographer, and as you probably know, that's intentional camera movement, or as I like to term it, painting with a camera through movement of the camera while taking the picture. A few months ago, I attended a seminar on kinetic photography that really got me started in the area that we're going to talk about today. In that seminar, they talked about the use of random light and random movement of the camera to make photographs. And I was thinking of ways that I could improve upon that by somewhat trying to manage the mixture of light and colors that was occurring to make a photograph that seemed to flow a little bit better than what you get with kinetic photography. So I began exploration in a number of different areas and settled on colored wires with ICM techniques and I made a few photographs and put them up on Facebook. And a few days after posting to Facebook, I started to get a lot of questions about how do you make that work? How is it actually done? So I tried answering a number of emails and a number of questions through the uh, social networks, and that was a little bit clunky because there are a lot of moving parts to this. So I thought I would make a video, and here we are making my first ever video on this topic. And I hope it works out well. Um, if you have any suggestions for improvement any future videos, please let me know. But today we're going to share with you my techniques for ICM photography, how it works, what my processing methods are, and what goes into making a colored wire ICM photograph. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, here we are in my little ICM studio. But before we start talking about the setup and how it all works, I want to talk with you about several things. The first is your camera. This form of photography is going to put a lot of clicks on your camera. I typically put between 500 and 1,000 clicks on my camera to get what I consider to be one exceptional image that I want to put on Facebook and share with other people. It's important to remember that when you're doing this, that no two images are going to ever be alike. So when you get a good combination of setup of your wires and movement of your camera that's giving you something that really looks good, just shoot, shoot, shoot. Make a lot of images of it because you're going to be really surprised at what comes out of that process once you find that right setup. Slight variations in light, and the placement of your wires and the movement of your camera are going to produce very, very big changes from image to image. And that's why you want to shoot a lot of images in this process. It's important to remember not to get discouraged if at first you don't succeed because it takes a lot of images to shoot this uh, type of uh, photography. So if it doesn't work, change your wire positioning, change your lighting positioning, change your camera movement technique, and just keep on going. Eventually, you're going to find what's going to work for you. On the uh, subject of cameras also, I recommend a mirrorless camera over a DSLR camera because a mirrorless camera has a lot less moving parts in it, and it's likely to last over a longer period of time because there's going to be less wear and tear on the camera because of fewer moving parts. Let's talk now about hardware required to do this type of ICM photography. As I explained earlier, I prefer a mirrorless over DSLR camera. My own personal camera is a Fuji X-T2. It's got over 180,000 clicks on it now. It's still going strong. And I really like the camera because of its lightweight and it's very easy to move around for extended periods of time when taking these photographs that are required to do ICM photography of wires. As far as lenses, I have experimented with quite a few different lenses and I prefer the shorter focal, focal lengths over the longer focal lengths simply because at these distances the shorter focal length lenses give a larger depth of field than the longer focal lengths do. And uh, that's important in dealing with, uh, you know, the one to two inches that are very often uh, separating the wires that are involved in the photographs that you are taking. Now, the three lenses that I personally have landed on after experimenting with quite a few 
are the Lens Baby Velvet 28. That is my go-to lens. Uh, I like it in the F4 to F8 range, and uh, it does an exceptional job. The second lens that I use is the uh, Rokinon 12 millimeter lens. It's not a very expensive lens, and it does uh, quite a decent job. It's not a fisheye lens. It is a uh, standard wide angle lens. It's got a 109 degree, I believe, uh, angle of view on it, which is just about perfect for moving around these uh, wires when you're taking photographs. The third lens I use is actually part of a lens system. It is part of the Lens Baby Composer uh, Pro system, and I use the 12 millimeter. Yeah, there's the uh, module right there, the 12 millimeter fisheye module, and you can take these out and pop different modules in. But the 12 millimeter fisheye is really kind of unique in that it's got a. Uh, you can see the barrel, the edges of the barrel on the inside of the uh, lens, and during your movement process with the lens very often the image will bleed out side of that ring and it creates some very unusual and intriguing images as a consequence. So those are the three lenses I use. The fourth piece of equipment which I really recommend is a nine stop neutral density filter which can be found by a number of different uh, manufacturers on Amazon. And this neutral density filter is really important even though I'm dealing with uh, photography in a rather controlled studio situation. And the reason for it is this. First off, I find that when I am taking a photograph that my uh, body movement and my camera movement tends to be just about ideal at between one and one and a half seconds per exposure. So I like to stay locked into that time frame for a shutter speed. Secondly, I don't like to move my ISO too much above 800 because with all of the motion that's occurring in this rather low light situation, I can get into a lot of grain really quickly. Uh, the third thing is that uh, with the uh, wide angle lenses between f4 and f8 seems to be the sweet spot to get bleed over between the colors of the different wires that I'm using in any image. And if I go too low in my f-stop, I get a lot of blur. If I go too high in my f-stops, I'm not getting the bleed that I would like. So I'm locked into really uh, these uh, three variables. And as you know, these three variables are the variables that control the amount of light getting to your camera. So. Uh, I'm varying the amount of light that gets to my camera with my neutral density filter. If I find that my setup's giving me a little bit low light, I open it up a little bit. If I find that I've got too much light in the scene, I step it down a little bit on the neutral density filter, and that way I'm not having to deal with going faster or going slower to get to the speed that I need to get the effect that I want. As far as the light is concerned, this is just a little generic, I believe it's 25 watt lamp that uh, is used for uh, photographing in a studio. And I have built a little uh, condenser on one of my two lamps here to keep most of the light on the wires and off of the black background of the box that I'm working in. That's important to get the to, to get the contrast that's required to make the image really pop when you photograph it. As far as the box is concerned, my box is a 3x3 three three box with a uh, removable black sheet on it. And uh, it's got a lot of hooks in it, a lot of holes in it because I'm constantly attaching and detaching wires. That just makes uh, things a lot easier. And uh, that brings us to the issue of wires. You can spend a lot of money on wires, by the way, if you want to. And uh, you're going to have to have a lot of different colors of wires in this whole process. The best way to go about this is to go to a place like Lowe's or Home Depot and buy five feet of 10-strand sprinkler wire. Strip off the outside casing, and every wire inside that, uh, five, inside that sprinkler wire has got a different color to it. 
and uh, with just a purchase of about four to five dollars, you've got yourself a lot of different colors of wire to uh, create these different scenes to photograph. So that's basically it for the setup. Oh, one last thing here. Uh, another thing that I got at Home Depot that I really like is called Mason Line. And this is available in the hardware section in a number of different colors. And the reason why I like Mason Line is it's composed of three strands of nylon string that are wound together, twisted together pretty tight. But when they're placed under a light, and you really can't see that here, but when they're placed under a light, they create areas of light and shadow. And when you're doing ICM photography, that light and shadow will create a really nice fan effect that when mixed appropriately with these wires produces a very interesting result. So I really strongly suggest that you experiment with different types of strings as well as the wires in these photographs. So that's basically it for the setup. And now we're going to talk about actually doing these photographs. One thing that's a real helpful aid in uh, doing this is a ruler of sorts. And the reason why we want to do that is because I want to know with my camera approximately where I'm going to be in focus throughout the uh, field of this string. So right now I've got my camera set up so that I am at approximately uh, a 12 inch distance from the scene and I want to find out where that 12 inches is. So I want to keep my rotation approximately here to keep all of that in, in, uh, in focus. Now I can do that with my viewfinder to begin with, but after I get going, the viewfinder goes blank and I want to know where to begin and end my rotation. As a beginning in this, if you're just starting out, uh, one of the easiest ways to get good results is to do a vertical rotation to a single point. Make sure in your scene you've got both vertical elements, and my little uh, stranded string here has got a vertical element in it, and some horizontal elements in it here with my uh, blue wire, a little bit of vertical right there, because it's that combination of vertical and horizontal that's going to give you the fanning that you're looking for in this type of photography. The, uh, what you're basically doing is as you rotate the camera, you are dragging your sensor across the uh, colored wire that is lit, and that's what's going to paint the image onto the sensor, and it's finally going to appear on your computer when you uh, download it. So anyhow, let's go ahead and get started with this. My single point of focus is right here. 12 inches is approximately right here. So what I'm going to do is get the center of the camera on that point, and I'm going to try to keep that camera, uh, keep that center on that point as I rotate the camera. So here we go. Okay, that was just a tad dark, so I'm going to open up the neutral density filter a little bit. Oh, that's much better. And I'm going to do it again, I'm going to rotate it again. Okay, that photograph was just a tad busy, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to move things around a little bit. No. There we go. Change my light source a bit, so I hit that point, and for approximately 12 inches, I'm going to rotate it yet again. That created a pretty good image right there, and we'll review these in just a minute. So now that I've got a place where I'm getting a fairly decent image, what I want to do is I want to take quite a few of them. Because when you get these into editing and start post-processing, you're going to find that some of them are going to turn out good, some of them aren't going to be as good as they look in the uh, viewfinder. Okay, so that's basically what I'm doing. Now, you can do that with just doing the rotation like that, but you can get some really intriguing photographs by mixing it up. In addition to doing the rotation, 
move your camera from left to right, move your camera up and down, move it in and out, combine all those elements as though you were flying an airplane, go in and out and rotate at the same point in time, and you will find that you'll have some very happy accidents that will recur occur as a result of that. So once you get a good setup, one that you know is working, one that's fairly well lit, and we're going to test this one again. I wanted to do something like that. There we go. I am going to check out the rotation. That image looks pretty good. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in, out, and then snap at the end. I'm going to put a snap there at the end. I'm going to try to end up right there so I get the strings in or the wires in focus as well as fan so I can get two elements there. Okay, there's another rotation. Now I'm going to rotate and move to the side like that. That produced a really stellar image there. I'm going to go up, follow that one hour up, one wire up and then rotate on all this. Whoops, I missed it there. Let's go again. Up and rotate. I can go up, rotate to the side, and I caught the, uh, the lighting that time. I should probably do it the other way. There we go. Oh, that produced a very, very nice star for me. And continue on like that and just do different mix-ups of that uh, type of rotation and you'll find that you're going to get a lot of uh, really interesting photographs as a consequence. Now it's really important in all of this to pay attention to your output. Review your output after each photograph you take to watch for hot spots in this whole image. Two ways to deal with hot spots. Number one, you can move your uh, lighting slightly off of your image. Or number two, you can change your neutral density filter. Or if you want, you can change your exposure time just a little bit. It's important to avoid those hot spots because, that can, because as you know, hot spots become problematic in post-processing. Okay, it's important just to, uh, once you get this set up, to keep experimenting with it. Because, as I said, happy accidents are going to happen. And uh, you're going to get into some unexpected things as a consequence of uh, doing this type of photo photography. I'll show you two photographs that I took. One I call the Kraken, the other I call two dancers. Both were actually happy accidents. I did not plan them at all. And they're two of my favorite photographs. So this is uh, something that uh, you know you just uh, keep working at and you're going to get some good images out of it. And the important part is uh, keep experimenting, keep moving around. It's great to have some music in the background during this because you'll find yourself dancing as you do this. Uh, keep moving your wires around once you've exhausted your uh, once you've exhausted one scene. That doesn't look like a heck of a lot of change, but whenever I rotate the camera around that, that's going to give me a dramatic change. And we'll see some of that when we get in. Oh, that's beautiful. See that when we get into the post. So that's basically what I'm doing here with all of this. Uh, imaging. If you want to get a battle type effect on this, this is really great. I didn't talk about this. Get it in focus and then do something like this. And that's going to give you an image that's going to look like a huge barrel, uh, a blue and green barrel inter intermixed with one another there. So that's what I'm doing. Oh, it's also good to, uh, we can see what we're doing here because I have the uh, light here so we can uh, do the video. But it's also good to have a small flashlight. When you're doing this in the dark and all you've got is that light on this uh, scene right here, it's good to have the flashlight available to check the settings on your camera. Uh, it's kind of tough to do in the dark. Okay, so let's uh, take these images now and let's go look at them in the uh, computer and see what we've got. The first thing I do with my ICM photographs is import them into Adobe Lightroom. When I import them into Adobe Lightroom, I then examine, examine them for their technical characteristics. And I also look for photographs that might be able to tell a bit of a story for the viewer. These are abstract photographs, so you've got to use your imagination in them. This is the photograph that I've chosen. 
to uh, show you how I do the post-processing. Although it doesn't look like it's telling much of a story right now, watch what happens when we rotate it 90 degrees. Whoops, I rotated it in the wrong direction. Let me do that the other way. Image. Image rotation, 90 degrees clockwise. There we go. Now, can you see the green man with the green cape running away or running out of the waves? So this is what I see in this photograph. You may see something totally different but it's something that I look for in photographs that I produce. Okay, the first thing I want to do is get rid of a little bit of this empty area here on the right. So I'm going to crop this image and just take a little bit of it out. Both the bottom and the side. Okay, looks pretty good right now. Now I'm going to take and under the filter, go into the camera raw filter. And here is where I'm going to do my first adjustments to the photograph. This photograph actually looks pretty good right now, but I'm going to tweak it just a little bit. I'm going to jump the exposure up just a little bit to bring out some of those darker areas. Maybe give it just a tad more contrast. Although the contrast in this one's pretty good because I did get to get a good black dark background here. I'm going to drop the highlights down momentarily, and I'll show you in a minute why I'm doing that. Now I'm going to bring the shadows up a little bit. The whites are pretty much okay where they're at. The blacks are okay. Now I'm going to do the first thing to really make the image pop. I'm going to bring the texture up to help bring out some of these lines in the photograph. And then I'm going to up the clarity. And you can see that photograph starting to emerge from the background. The dehaze slider will also help with that. And you just have to play around with it because that's going to vary from photograph to photograph. Okay, it's pretty much where I like it right now, so I'm going to click OK. Now from here, I'll typically go into Image, Adjustments, brightness and contrast. And the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to very carefully start to up that brightness and watch what happens. The first thing that really brightens isn't those white areas as much as it is those background areas. So I can really make that photograph pop against that background by doing that. By dropping them down in camera raw and then bring them back up in the brightness and contrast control. Next thing I fairly often do is I check the auto tone because sometimes they can get a little bit better tonal quality in the image, although the tonal quality was quite good in this one to begin with. It did bring the greens up just a little bit, not a lot. Now I'm going to go into the levels and I'm going to compress the background just a little bit, compress the darks. You can see how it made it pop a little bit more. And then bring the midtones up just a little bit. So now I've got an image which is really popping from the background. I like that one. Sometimes I do sharpen these images. Sometimes I don't sharpen the images. It just depends on what's involved in the image. Right here I've got a lot of fanning striations between that green and that blue wire. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to go to the filter and I'm going to go to the unsharp mask and I'm going to sharpen this up just a little bit, about nine pixels, about 90% on the sharpening. And you can see that made it pop just a little bit further. And that is basically what I do to generate these wire ICM photographs. And just for the fun of it, I took a photograph of what the original wire looked like, and that is right here. So basically, through ICM, we took these two wires. We started with a pan up vertical on this green. Then I rotated around this blue wire and ended up right about here. And as a consequence of that mixing and fanning that occurred, 
we ended up with this. And that is the technique that I use to produce these photographs. The one last thing that I may do with this before I save it, and I usually do this with all photographs, is run it through Topaz and do a little bit of noise clean out. So that's basically it. Well, that's about it for now. I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my video, and I hope you got a thing or two out of it. I certainly had a lot of fun making this video today, and I hope you have a great journey in ICM wire photography. If you get a chance, take a moment to look at my website, ddayphotography.zenfoliosite.com, and drop me an email and let me know how you're doing in your endeavors with this fascinating area of photographic adventure. Have a great day.